It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Larry Lasseur from the CBS television news staff, and Kenneth Crawford, national affairs editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Guy M. Gillette, Senator from Iowa. Probably not since the days of the Spanish Civil War has so much thinking centered about those two words, intervention or non-intervention. Now, President Eisenhower has said that Indochina is the cork in the bottle that keeps almost all of Asia from communist control. Our guest tonight, Senator Gillette, is one of the ranking Democrat members of the powerful Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And so for a start, Senator, if I may, I'd like to ask you what you think we should do in Indochina. Well, of course, the, uh, uh, Larry, the answer to what, we sh uh, to what we should do now is an entirely different to, from the question as to what we should have done in the past. But we do have to face the situation as it is there today. And as you have just said, it's a very serious one. The th necessary thing, in my opinion, is to have a definite program, a definite policy that will end the confusion so far as our people are concerned. They'll have some idea of what we're trying to do, as well as our allies. They can be assured of some definite plan. As it is at the present, it, it is very indefinite. Well, Senator Gillette, you said not long ago that you favored uh, turning over the problem of Indochina to the United Nations. Do you feel, still feel that might uh, accomplish anything? I feel it's essential. Uh, we, uh, the United Nations, in my opinion, it marks the high point in international cooperation for world security, and I think international cooperation is essential for world security for more involvement. We are not using it at the present time in the Indochina situation wherein it differs very materially from the situation that pertained uh, in uh, Korea at the time we became involved there when we went in under the aegis of the United Nations, working for United Nations principles with 16 uh, associates that were contributing military forces and some 60 other nations that were contributing at least moral support. Whereas we're in uh, Korea, We've made no attempt to bring this to the United Nations. We've been proceeding unilaterally in the aid that we have given France and uh, Vietnam, of course, as a subsidiary of France. Senator, uh, some six weeks ago, I think you made a speech in which you said time was running out here. Isn't it now a question of perhaps time having run out? I'm afraid that uh, there's too much truth in that, but... Uh, uh, it is true, as you suggested, that on the floor of the Senate, I said at that time, time was running out, and I felt that there were three things that we could do even then. We had time before Geneva. One was uh, to give assurance to the people of the associated states of, of Indochina that we would support their aspirations for full independence, to bring the matter before the United Nations and bring the United Nations in under the... Uh, the obligations that we all had incurred, and then to try to build up a, uh, an area regional defense pact under the United Nations. That uh, was not done at the time. Don't you feel, Senator, that uh, uh, we're now beyond the place where direct intervention is a question here? Yes, and yet at the same time, uh, we're in a desperate situation. We have been carrying, are carrying right this minute, 70% of the burden of that war in, in cost. I don't know how, and our people are asking. Uh, Ken, our people are asking, how did we become involved? How did we become subrogated? Why did that suddenly become our responsibility? France has been fighting in Indochina for seven and a half years. Those people have been trying to uh, secure their independence. How did we happen to find it our war at the present time? And what are we going to do about it? We have spent this last year over a billion dollars in support. And the peculiar thing about it is that it hasn't gone 
uh, to Vietnam, it's gone to France. And France has used it in the any way that she sees fit. Well, uh, Senator, uh, there seems to be some doubt, actually, uh, if we could get a majority vote in the United Nations with so many frightened Asiatic nations there. Now, what do you think of the possibility of getting a regional United uh, Action or United Front in Indonesia? I think we can accomplish that, uh, uh, Mr. Lesur. I'm sure we can. We have proceeded in uh, negotiation, developing regional pacts under the United but Nations. But I'd just like to point out only a few months ago, we wouldn't allow France and Britain to go into our ANZUS pact with New Zealand and Australia in the Pacific, and now we seem to want them in very badly. We're urging them to come in, and there'll be some hesitancy in bringing them in. The present plan, as I uh, understand it, is not only to bring France and uh, Great Britain in, but uh, uh, the Associated States of Indochina and Philippines and the possibility of Japan. But, uh, of course, along with New Zealand and Australia. The, uh, and the possibility of Burma. The whole idea being that we can bring in the states that have a community of interest in that area. Time, as, uh, as Ken suggested, is pretty well run out. Well, but uh, it's as you and Ken thing. suggested, that uh, it is a pretty desperate situation, but is there any optimism to be drawn from the Geneva Conference? So we note that uh, the Russians seem to be more amenable to an armistice there, which might be controlled by neutral states, they've said. Uh, do you feel that there is any reason for optimism over the results of this conference in Geneva? So far as I've seen any reports from Geneva, I see no occasion for optimism at all. Apparently, the uh, uh, communist group and the communist satellites are in the saddle there, and so far, they've, uh, up to the present time, they've given every evidence they expect to remain in the saddle and are going to dictate the terms. We have a very able man there in General Beetle Smith, very keen and very able. But he, no man can accomplish anything unless you have a definite purpose and plan uh, in which he's to work. Well, Senator, as a practical matter, uh, Next in the Far East, uh, what is it? Uh, a security pact of some kind and a new line, a new defense line somewhere, I take it. That's about the only thing you can do. I think it's absolute folly, uh, Ken, to, uh, to talk about uh, a blockade, uh, to blockade the coast, an economic blockade, or to turn loose Jan uh, uh, forces on the mainland. The first place they cannot accomplish anything. We have our airplanes or our uh, airplane carriers at the present time in the Tonkin Gulf. But if we brought all the naval force of America to, into a blockade there, it uh, could well bring in the Chinese Empire into full-scale war, and if it's so, it would inevitably bring the Russian Empire into. And that well, would be Third World War. That'll be Third well, Senator, World War. Senator, we seem to be thinking of in terms of too much, too late. But uh, while we're thinking of what we haven't done in Indochina, what about places we can do something? There seems to be a very bad situation now in the Middle East where most of the world's great oil reserves are underground. Would you uh, form any kind of a coalition to secure that area? Well, of course, as you know, we, are, uh, we have made rather marked progress in that direction. We started with the NATO pact, then later we extended it to uh, include Greece and Turkey. Now uh, we are working, and w with measurable success, uh, to bring Pakistan and possibility of Iraq in. That will extend it still but further. But even so, there doesn't seem to be any disposition on our part to secure a firm peace in uh, the Middle East vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, between the Israelis and the Arabs. That, seem, that situation seems to be deteriorating rapidly. It is. And uh, I had the rather dubious privilege of, of uh, visiting nine of those countries last fall uh, in that area, in the Near Eastern area. And the situation there is rather desperate. The, uh, uh, there's no improvement in relations between uh, the Arab states and Israel. In fact, every one of the Arab states told me, the leaders told me at that time, that they were uh, defeated by Israel militarily, but that they were going to bring her to her knees economically through the uh, blockading her and destroying her industrially. Senator, while I have some time left, I'd like to turn the subject to another one, and that's the, uh, in view of the hearings now taking place in Washington, I'd like to ask you a question. Some people are saying that the caliber of our 
representatives in Congress now has deteriorated. Now, you've been in Congress for more than 20 years. Do you feel that uh, we no longer have men of the caliber of Norris, Bora, the elder La Follette? Oh, no, I wouldn't say that. Uh, the uh, Congress is a cross-section of uh, uh, men throughout the country, the length and breadth of the country. The districts and the states certainly select men in whom they have confidence. We have poor uh, congressmen. We have uh, very able congressmen. We've had them in the past, and uh, we have them at the present time. Of course, it's uh, probably a fortunate thing the distance lends enchantment, and uh, we forget uh, the weaknesses as uh, time goes by. But I would say that this, con this Congress compares very favorably with the preceding Congresses. You feel that there are giants in this Congress as well as there were in the past? Then? Yes, see, we have giants in this Congress, and we have members in this Congress that perhaps we could dispense with without any pain. Okay, well, thank you very much, Senator Gillette. We're proud to have you here tonight. The opinions expressed on the Longines chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Kenneth Crawford. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Guy M. Gillette, Senator from Iowa. The satisfaction which comes from owning a Longines watch is above and beyond price. The old words, accuracy and reliability, take on a new and true meaning when applied to a Longines watch. A Longines watch brings priceless peace of mind, for one knows where one stands with time all the time. Now this is the result of experience. For almost a century, Longines has made watches which, by observatory standards, have consistently been equal or superior in accuracy to the best achievements of each decade. Further proof is found in this fact. Among the finest watches of the world, only Longines watches have been honored with 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes and 28 Gold Medal Awards. Yet, though Longines is one of the finest of all watches, there are many beautiful models for both ladies and gentlemen, which can be purchased for as little as $71.50. You may buy a watch in the weeks ahead for a graduate, for a wedding or an anniversary present, or as the perfect Father's Day gift. Then, remember these facts about Longines. And if someone forgets you, why not remember yourself? The satisfaction that comes from owning a Longines is truly above and beyond price. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.